So today we pose the question, if you have about $100,000 to spend, what's the best street legal track toy out there? Well, the obvious choice is the Cayman GT4, the Porsche fanboy favorite. But today we're gonna put it up against the 650 horsepower monster from Detroit, the Camaro ZL1 1LE. Will the Cayman stack up against this beast and will it prove truly worthy of the GT status? Today we're gonna find out. This is Track Attack. The Porsche Cayman was introduced in 2006 as a mid-level sports car offering from Porsche. It has been a great sports car since its inception and often praised for its superior handling characteristics over the company's flagship 911 model. This is due to the fact that the Cayman is a mid-engine platform versus the 911's rear engine layout. The 911 has been offering its race-derived GT2 and GT3 class variants over several generations now. This upgrade takes the 911 from a great sports car to a street legal race car. With powertrain, suspension, aero, and interior upgrades, this creates an entirely new driving experience and brings the car to supercar levels of performance. If the top tier GTS Cayman is not enough sports car for the prospective Cayman buyer, then Porsche has another option, the GT4. Just as the GT3 and GT2 cars are the race-inspired cousins of the 911, the GT4 is the street-legal race version of the Cayman. With performance upgrades borrowed from the GT3, this Cayman is ready to hit the track. In true race car fashion, the GT4 has numerous upgrades over the base Cayman for increased performance and a race car experience. Porsche's GT department decided to use an already winning formula and build off of the success of their previous cars. The front suspension and brakes are taken from the 911 GT3. It has adaptive dampers from the GT3 RS. The seats are pulled right out of the 918 Spider. The steering wheel is said to be inspired by the 918 as well. Even the engine is bored from the 911, but in this case, the GT4 uses a 4 liter, 8,000 RPM, bored, stroked, and turbo-free version of the 992 generation 3 liter engine. The rear suspension setup is an all new element and unique to the GT4. And in an effort to further increase performance, it also has increased downforce over the previous models and can generate up to 330 pounds to help with high speed grip and stability. I'm a really big Porsche fan. I love the brand, respect their racing heritage. I used to own and compete in a 911 myself. So sitting here in the newest iteration of the Cayman, especially in GT4 trim, I should be super excited. But somehow I'm not. This car though comes equipped with a four liter flat six engine revving to 8,000 RPM and making over 400 horsepower. And it even has a real honest to God manual transmission. So you think this would be a recipe for one of the best Porsche cars ever made. Yet somehow it's not. Don't get me wrong. This is a Porsche. It's an excellent sports car. You can bring it to the racetrack. You can beat it all day long and it'll smile and keep churning out consistent lap times while doing so. This is a GT4. This is a GT race car from Porsche. When I compare this to something like the GT3, it just doesn't have that same zing to it. The GT3 is a street legal race car. When you push that thing around a racetrack, heck, when you even drive it on the street, it's an experience. The, the, the handling of the chassis, the engine, the brakes, just everything about it is an experience to behold. This car though, just doesn't quite do that for me. So first off, let's talk about the engine. This four liter engine isn't a true GT engine, it's not derived from the racing cars. This is actually a modified streetcar engine. It's from the three liter turbo 911. They take it out, 
rip off the turbos, make it a four liter, and yes, they do a whole bunch of work to make it into a really good naturally aspirated engine. But that's just it. They made it a really good engine. Porsche usually isn't big on mediocrity. Usually they're going for the moon. It's go big or go home. That's the way Porsche does things. The GT3 is a great example of that. Yet, in this car, the engine feels like it's a very good engine, but not a spectacular engine. And of course, we still have a manual transmission in a GT car. That's awesome. But what happened to the gear ratios? Why did they make such long gear ratios that simply just don't match the power band? With a car like this, that is supposed to be made for performance, and yet the gear ratios certainly don't help that. Now, another small gripe I have about this being a GT car is actually the interior. When I sit here and look around, it's a very nice interior, but I think about a GT3 and how it feels more race car. It's got more Alcantara everywhere. It has carbon fiber everywhere. This car has a sprinkling of each, but it's not enough to make it feel that much more special than the regular Cayman. In fact, I've driven the newest Cayman in GTS trim with all the performance options on it around this track. And this car doesn't feel too much different than that, to be honest. Yes, I do like the naturally aspirated engine far better than the Turbo 4. Yet, ironically, for this price point, I would probably want the Turbo 4. At least you have a more usable power band and you have the PDK with the better gears. So you kind of feel like you actually have a little more performance out of that one, especially for low speed corners. That engine just makes amazing torque at almost any RPM. So it can really haul you out of the corners. With this engine, you really have to keep the RPMs up to make it move. But with these gear ratios, sometimes you just can't depending on the corner. All this combined, this just doesn't feel like a race car for the street. It just feels like a sports car. And it's not that that's a bad thing. Porsche makes some of the best sports cars in the world, and I truly believe this is one of them. I just don't think it's a true GT race car in true Porsche fashion. Of course, after saying all these negative things about the car, we have to talk about some good things. And yes, this car certainly has them. The one thing we have to mention right off the bat is the handling. Porsche certainly didn't compromise in that area. I have to say, without a doubt, this is the best mid-engine car I've ever driven. And I've driven an awful lot of them. It's just everything about this car, Porsche dialed in right. The steering input, the way the car rotates, the grip, the front end balance, the rear balance, the way it transfers weight, the way it puts the power down, the way it even squats under braking, just everything about this car in terms of any part of handling dynamic is just sublime. It's just amazing. That's, there's no other way to describe it. So Porsche definitely get that part right. It's just too bad the rest of it they didn't. Porsche is not the only company that understands clients want track day special variants of their sports cars. Chevy seems to understand this as well. And this is the proof. The Camaro ZL1 1LE. This car features all the supercharged V8 goodness of the ZL1, but then adds on a host of track focused components that turns this into a track weapon. Packing 650 horsepower and 650 pound-feet of torque and capable of producing 1.1 Gs of lateral grip, this is not a car for the faint of heart. The reason it can achieve such impressive carving forces is because it comes equipped with dynamic suspension spool valve dampers from Canadian company Multimatic. It also possesses solid mount bushings and some of the most aggressive aero allowed on a streetcar. In fact, this aero is so aggressive, the European government deemed it too dangerous to pedestrians and banned it for sale in their market. With a car this hardcore, we had to find someone just as track focused. Enter Jen Gray. Jen is a very seasoned go-kart racer with years of experience and wins under her belt. She also likes taking her car control skills to the limit by competing in ice racing. 
growing up around racetracks has given Jen the passion and knowledge any good race car driver needs to succeed. Having a Corvette as one of her track toys makes her already intimate with the brand and the right person to give us her insights on the ZL1 1LE. I'm gonna start off by saying I don't really have too many expectations coming into driving this car. I've never actually driven a Camaro of any sort on the track, let alone something this specifically built for the track. So I'm honestly just excited to see how it's gonna perform in perspective to any of the other cars I've driven, um, like my Corvette or any other car. So in my personal opinion, before Chevy released this spec of the Camaro, I kind of think that the Camaro has kind of fallen onto the back burner when it came to cars, at least track cars built by Chevy. I mean, come on, you've got the Camaro, that thing is a track weapon, and I think they really focus a lot of their time and effort into that car. So I'm really excited to see this car and kind of bring Camaro back to the forefront for Chevy. So initial thoughts, this thing is crazy. I'm gonna give it a little bit of a shot here to feel the 650 horsepower. Oh my God. <laughs> oh wow, okay. Yeah, that is insane. Okay, you can really feel the power. That is crazy. So I did get a bit of wheel spin coming out of that corner just because it really does have so much power. It is so fun. So I obviously expected this car to be quick in a straight line because let's face it, it has a ton of power as we just saw on the straight, but I kind of am not sure how it's gonna perform through these tight sections. So I'm gonna try and start speeding it up a little bit here to kind of see how it's gonna react in these tight kind of technical turns here. A little bit of oversteer. So honestly, I am a little bit pleasantly surprised. I mean, I totally expected this to be obviously great on the straight, but I didn't really expect it to be able to be as responsive as it is in the corners. And for such a huge car, it feels shockingly nimble, which is kind of weird to say, but it really does. As you can see, I can't help but smile driving this thing. Holy, does the dual exhaust ever sound amazing in this car? Wow. I was really excited that I got to drive the manual version of this car. I am a manual girl. Uh, my C5 Corvette is manual. And honestly, I just really like how the manual drives compared to an automatic. Obviously, as a race car driver, you kind of want to be able to feel the car a bit under you. And I've never actually used active rev matching on any car. And surprisingly, I don't mind it. I mean, I know that there's a lot of mixed reviews by people who are manual drivers, who are used to, you know, heel toe downshifting like actual racing drivers. So let me just try it here again. So basically, as soon as you shift down, it matches the rev for you. You don't have to do it with your foot, which is kind of weird for me to get used to because I'm so used to doing it with my foot, but it is useful. And if you have like a newer driver, someone who's new to track days and might not be comfortable doing that themselves, maybe it's a good feature to kind of get them used to what it's supposed to be like, and then they can obviously start doing it for themselves. All right, so under braking, these Bremo brakes are really good, honestly. I didn't expect such a big car to be able to brake so efficiently, but I do have full confidence coming into the braking zones that the car is going to stop and I'm not gonna fly off the track, which is always good to know. I would certainly recommend this car to someone who's kind of just looking for something fun, reliable, balanced, and honestly, overall just what I would consider to be a successfully built track car. I mean, you've got so many of the integrated features like active rev matching, the adjustable suspension. I mean, there's so much that you get in this car and that can be adjusted to your liking when it comes to your track day that I certainly think that this would be a great option. If you have the money, go for it. Seriously, go for it. It's so fun. Like I haven't had this much fun on a track day in a car in a long time.
Even though these cars are street legal, we prefer to have them arrive at the track in true race car fashion, in the back of a high-end car transport trailer. Our friends at Safe Auto always make sure the stars of the show arrive safely and in style. They only use state-of-the-art, fully custom enclosed trailers. Safe Auto offers an array of services, including deal support and transfers, as well as personal vehicle transport. They also provide car storage in a brand new 40,000 square foot facility. Safe Auto brings over 50 years of industry experience to the game and is the best choice for car transport and storage in Ontario. What if a street legal race car is not enough and you want something a little more purposeful to race in? What is the alternative? One option is this car. A professionally race prepped Porsche 944. This car is part of a fleet of 944s available to rent from one of our partners, Ultra Ray Motorsports. They are a race team and retail outlet based out of Oakville, Ontario. Ultra Ray provides a turnkey arrive and drive program for anybody who wants to dip their toe in wheel to wheel racing without having to break the bank. Everything is provided including food and coaching. You just have to show up and have fun. With decades of racing experience, Ultra Ray Motorsports is the place to race. So both these cars are excellent options if you want a street legal car. And of course, today we're very lucky to have Jen with us to share her opinion on these two wonderful cars. Thanks for joining us today, Jen. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I had such a fun drive, time driving the Camaro and it really outlived my expectations, to be honest. So the one thing though, I have to say, wasn't my favorite thing about the Porsche was actually the character. So I think you saw in my review when I was driving it that it's a great car, don't get me wrong, very good sports car but it just doesn't have that, that GT race car appeal to it, for me at least. I know a lot of people like it. Just didn't do it for me. The engine is just pretty good. Like everything about the car is just pretty good. It doesn't have that race car appeal. Again, you did the review in the Camaro. What, what was your take on that? What was the character like? Did you feel it was like a race car or kind of a sports car? What was your take on it? I mean, to be honest, I, I see where you're coming from and obviously had an amazing dry time driving the Camaro as well, but I wouldn't say that it's race car territory, although I did have a lot of fun in it and it did have a lot of race car elements. So it's kind of hard to say, but I think that I kind of share a lot of your opinion when I, when I say that definitely it's not at that level where I could kind of call it race car territory, but it was obviously still fun and such a good sports car, especially considering that you drive it on the street as well. So can't really ask for more than that, I would say. So, but then again, you're probably biased with that considering most of your career, you drove a go-kart. <laughs> I'm sure everything else by comparison feels soft and muted, right? Yes, 100%. I'm used to very down to the ground, like, you know, you know, but, but I mean, this was, this is kind of similar to a go-kart. It, it kind of had that feel too. It, you could really tell that you were driving the car, you're putting in all the inputs, you can really feel the car under you, which I did like. It's, it's similar to a go-kart in that sense, for sure. So to find out a bit more about the Cayman GT4, today we're very fortunate to have a special guest. We have Dirk Duncheda from Polycaro Motorsports. He's the team manager and he's going to share his insights with us today. Dirk, come on in. Hi, how are you? Thanks for coming out today. Pleasure, man. So we really appreciate you taking your time to come out with us today, Dirk. So first thing I want to know is really what's kind of your role and tail with uh, Polycaro and, and what do you guys do with your motorsports team? Uh, well, I oversee the whole motorsports program. Uh, in last year, or 2019, we uh, campaigned two uh, GT3 Cup cars in the uh, Canada uh, Cup Series, and, uh, sponsored by Yokohama. And uh, we actually came in second team championship. Cool, congrats. Uh, so we had a 2018 and a 2019 Cup car, and uh, that's what we did for the motorsports side. We also support a lot of client cars with uh, Cayman uh, GT4 Club Sports and uh, Cup cars and just uh, track-ready street cars. So then you're the guy to talk about Porsches and GT cars and all that performance stuff, clearly. So the first thing I want to know is, why is the Cayman, in my opinion, not GT car-ish? And by that, what I mean is when you drive a GT3, it does feel like a race car still. Not as much as, of course, as the cup cars, but as far as road cars go, it, it's a race car, right? Now, when I reviewed the GT4, it was an excellent sports car. I was very impressed with it. It did very well, and, and I loved it. However, I still don't feel like it's really a true GT car in the same spirit as the GT3. What's your take on that? What's your opinion? 
Well, I think, you know, it is, in my opinion, it is a true GT car. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a lot of the features built into it from the factory that I would consider make it a GT car, such as adjustable suspension, you know, upgraded brakes. Uh, a lot of the bushings are monoball or, you know, but there's an absence of rubber for uh, noise suppression, things like that. So you do get a much harsher feel in the car as a normal street going version. Uh, and it is, it has the adjustments necessary to allow it to just dance a little bit more on the knife edge when it comes to track driving. Uh, I do think that the GT, the Cayman GT4 is downplayed slightly from the GT3 when you compare them apples to apples, obviously. Uh, they do have to keep little brother down uh, the wrong a little bit, you know. Um, but I definitely, I definitely think that uh, the 2020 version is, uh, is an improvement on the last one for sure. So we kind of know that the Camaro has pretty aggressive suspension. In terms of the Porsche, how adjustable is that compared to the Camaro? Uh, well, I mean, I can't speak for the Camaro. I do know that obviously it has a coilover style setup and, and there's, you know, camber toe adjustments that can be made. I think one of the things the Porsche still does bring to the table is, um, although the amount of adjustment is limited, there are, the adjustments they do give you are huge. So the coilovers are height adjustable. Uh, the camber, you know, one of the things that it does bring over from the club sport is the lower adjustable control arms. So it actually, you can shim them, make them wider, give them a wider track, uh, you know, stance uh, for the, the actual geometry of the suspension. Uh, so the, the options that they give you to adjust, they give you quite a bit of adjustment, but they limit others. So it's not a full spectrum. They just give you a bunch of little things. In both the auto slalom track course and in the drag race, what do you think is going to happen? Who's going to come out on top? Well, I have a bias, obviously, <laughs> but uh, I would say probably in the drag race, I think I would know who they might, you know, be the best at that. Um, uh, with the autocross, though, I still believe that, uh, or I would expect to see the GT4 uh, with the advantage there. Uh, just from the mid-engine and the, the, uh, the nimbleness of it, that would be my expectation, but I guess we'll see. Okay, I'm sitting here waiting for my next turn, watching Jen go through in that big Camaro. Whew, that is a big car to push through the autocross course. But I gotta say, watching her go though, she's handling it quite well. She's definitely starting to get a feel for that car, it's starting to rotate better, I'm noticing. She's definitely figuring the course out, that's for sure. You can tell she's picked up a lot of speed. That was a good run. Nicely done, Jen, nicely done. <laughs> Jen, how was your first autocross experience? Oh my gosh, it was so fun, but I gotta say, I definitely do need some coaching. <laughs> That's okay, because when you first start doing autocross, it is a very different experience than driving on the track or karting or anything, frankly, you've done. So um, I gotta say, the watching you, it looked like your runs were still really good. I think you did a good job. Let's face it, in this case, I definitely had the better car. 
I think for the road course, uh, maybe, maybe not. I think for autocross, unfortunately, I had the advantage. And I've done it a couple more times than you, unfortunately. But I gotta say, you did a very good job for your first time, so nicely done. Thank you, appreciate it. Are you ready for the times? Yes, I guess, I guess. <laughs> Which one do you wanna hear first, the Camaro or the Porsche? Let's go with the Porsche. The Porsche, okay. So the best time out of the three runs in the Porsche was a 44.25. Oh, nice. That was my best run. So, your best run was a 51.24. So, right. you know, it was right. close. We're both under a minute. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's kind of a toss up. It's close enough. We could say you're the winner, I'm the winner. It's the same thing, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. We, can, we can say that. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> I have the car advantage. So, let's just call it a tie. Everybody wins, okay. right? Okay. I like that. I like that. So, uh, what was your uh, input, though, first time doing autocross? What did you think about it? Honestly, it was really cool just to see how the car kind of operated through the tighter sections that you can't really exactly get on an actual track. So it was really cool to see how it performed in that kind of situation. Right. Drag race between the Porsche and the Camaro. The beauty and the brawn. I know the Porsche is going to take it off the line. I don't know what's going to happen after that. Stall? It pretty much did. Like, I was already going and I wanted to stall. Were you flooring it the whole time? Yeah. Weird. The tires on the Camaro had seen too many track days, and even launch mode was struggling to find grip on the straight. After several more attempts at launch mode and manual launches, the results were the same. Our director and Ontario Time Attack champion, Jay Sang, hopped in in an attempt to try and save the Camaro. With time running out on our track rental, we knew we couldn't let the Camaro leave with such a crushing blow on the drag strip. So we swapped cars for one more attempt. Jen in the Porsche, and me in the Camaro. With launch mode letting us down, I went for the manual launch option as well. So now that we've watched both the drag race and the autocross section of the episode, I really want to know your opinion, Dirk. Was it what you expected? I'm really interested. Let's start with the drag race. Well, so I was pleasantly surprised with the drag race, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of thought the horsepower would be a huge, huge advantage, like a, just a mind-boggling advantage. But obviously, traction is always an issue. Um, so I, I was, yeah, I was very pleasantly surprised to see how they were still within, you know, arm's length of each other. So that was a good thing for me to see. So now that we've seen both the drag race and the autocross, it's time to see the hot laps. Now, Dirk, what are your predictions? I'm curious to know. Well, I'd like to say my favorite is the one behind me. Uh, pleasantly surprised by the previous results, though. So honestly, I think it could go either way. We'll see. Yeah, let's find out.
So these two cars were remarkably close in the hot lap section. Dirk, what do you think about that? I mean, considering the Camaro on paper has a lot more than the Porsche, I, I have to admit, I think the Porsche, you know, held its own, given everything. Yeah, you know, I, I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, I, I think I kind of knew what might happen, <laughs> the potential there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was, I was surprised. And uh, you know what? I, I, that's great. Competition breeds excellence. So, you know, it's, it's all about pushing the limits for, for everyone. And, uh, and I, again, I think, you know, um, they're streetcars still at the end of the day, right? And I'm really impressed to see uh, both of them doing uh, what they did. So thanks so much for coming out today, Derek, and sharing your time and your insights with us. Uh, really appreciate somebody with your level of experience, especially around Porsche and the motorsports, coming out and, and you know, sharing this information with us and you know, just chit-chatting and, and picking your brain. Um, thank you so much, and we really look forward to maybe having you out again soon. I'd, I'd love it. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Today we found out you can't really go wrong with either option. They're both excellent street legal track toys. They're both a lot of fun. They're both great performance. I think it really comes down to price point. We know there's a big difference between the two cars. So what do you think? Yeah, so I agree. Obviously, I had a lot of fun driving the Camaro. You had a lot of fun driving the Porsche. I think, yeah, it really just comes down to how much you're willing to spend and do you want to pay the Porsche tax? <laughs> and speaking of Porsche tax, again, there, there is a big difference, let's face it. Um, one car is sub 100K and one is quite a bit past 100K. It's not like you're talking a $5,000 difference. So I'm sure that would definitely weigh into a lot of people's decision, I'm sure. So at that point, which one would you go with, Jen? Let, let, let's, let's start this first. Let's say if price wasn't an option, which one would you pick? You know what, I'm gonna stick to my roots. Even if price wasn't an option, I'd have to go with the Camaro. I mean, I'm just picturing myself even driving it on the street. I would feel so much cooler driving this car. <laughs> I, I just have to say, I mean, obviously the Porsche is amazing too, and I really think that these cars are both winners, but yes, my final answer would be Camaro. What about you? So you don't wanna look cute driving around in the Porsche? <laughs> no, really? I'm cute enough on my own, come on. Okay, <laughs> For me, if price wasn't an option, I think all things considered, I hate to say this, but yes, I'd go with the Camaro, I would. It, it, it really is just a fantastic car. It's got more performance, it really does. It's a little scary to drive its limits, but <laughs> at the end of the day, I like that actually, so yeah, yeah I, I would. Now, let's say if price was an option, I'm assuming we'd both go for the same thing. Yeah. So I guess, all things considered, I will say the Camaro won the day? I guess, yeah. I mean, they're so evenly matched, but yeah, I'm gonna have to give it to the Camaro for this one. All right, so I guess we both agree the Camaro is the clear winner today. Good job, Chevy. You know how to build a street legal track car, obviously. And we'll find out soon with some more really exciting Chevy products. Speaking of which, make sure you check out our next episode. Hit the like and subscribe button so you do not miss it when it hits the YouTube channel because we will be reviewing the C8 Corvette again. But this time we're gonna be doing the recommended GM alignment and we're also gonna be putting some stickier rubber on it. And we're gonna be putting it up against a bigger contender this time. So how good is the new C8? We're gonna find out on the next episode. So be sure to check us out then. And we'll see you at the track.